so the monsoons have arrived in Delhi. Um, I um, should t sorry. Sorry, what tree? Indra gods are happy. Indra gods are happy. Yeah. He's got rain here. I think the gods are happy with, with that we're doing this MOOC, I think. Yes. Um, so so uh, there are two or three things I, uh, three things I want to uh, talk about just uh, before we begin the session this morning. Uh, one is I hope uh, I can have the pleasure of having lunch with some of you or all of you today. Um, so. Um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, on other days I've been, uh, you know, more preparing and, and kind of resting my throat. I think today my throat is uh, <clears throat> better and maybe we can all have lunch together. Um, second, a question went through my mind uh, yesterday, which I wanted, um, is that supposing when all of you are, are teaching, um, how do you keep abreast of uh, you know, whatever is happening on India, the kind of latest research in your areas, for example, you know, PDS has improved, latest finding from, you know, Professor Himanshu of JNU. How do, how do you all keep in touch with that? Um, is, there, is there a way of, um, or, or you just, you teach what's in the syllabus and then move on? Is, is that how it works? No, as, as I filled up the survey also, yeah. uh, we sent to us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, I basically myself, I rely upon uh, the latest working papers supplemented by economic survey data in IMF, World Bank, and um, the NIPFP. Okay. And it's from a different I see, I see. Okay. So it, is that what all of you do? So, you know, uh, latest, uh, you know, EPW, uh, economic survey, IMF, World Bank. Um, sorry? I. Oh, Ideas for India. Oh, very good. Okay, good. Okay. Ideas for India is a website. Oh, excellent. Yeah, yeah. I think that is a very good source of uh, keeping track of the latest research on India. That's true. Uh, sorry? Okay, so please speak. Yeah, Li Live Mint has good coverage of, yeah. Okay, that's, that's, that's very good. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I would, I would uh, uh, you know, that's good. So uh, one, I, I would, you know, just... You know, Live Mint, uh, as you said, Ideas for India, a very good website on, uh, you know, the latest research taking place. Uh, I think from time to time, maybe you should also, you know, to keep abreast of international developments, uh, you know, also try and uh, access, you know, maybe the IMF's World Economic Outlook. You know, the Economist magazine from time to time has, you know, latest research uh, or, um, so, so, okay, so that's good. Uh, but, but these are, yeah. I uh, also have a lab component where I uh, expose them to various data sources and ask them to find out the trends for themselves. Okay, good. And, uh, you know, uh, yeah. implement it with uh, whatever the grid confirmation. Good, good. Are. Okay, so expose them to the latest uh, data, get them to, you know, get their hands dirty with the data. I think that's very good, yeah. Okay, good. Okay, um, <clears throat> so the session today is going to be on infrastructure, but I... Um, I want to just uh, finish off some things. Um, you know, some of you told me that uh, I rushed through uh, some of the sections on, on trade. Um, what I want to say is that there were questions on how did we calculate the you know, trade within India? How did we calculate migration within India? Uh, I would suggest that you know, after, uh, during lunch or afterwards, you know, my colleagues are here. Um, uh, Navneeraj Kapil, Gayatri, Parth um, uh, will tell you about more the details of how we calculated that and you know, feel free to, to, to go to them and, and uh, talk about that as well. Um, if you have any questions, I also rushed through you know, the sections on India and the WTO. I think there was a lot of interest on that. Uh, you know, I, I used to work at the WTO. What was, you know, what was the precursor to the WTO? The, a general agreement on tariffs and trade. I was there part of during the Uruguay round of trade negotiations. Uh, so if you have any questions on that, you know, we can do that later. But I just wanted to finish that with, uh, uh, you know, someone asked a question yesterday on, uh, you know, should we follow an, uh, you know, export-led strategy of growth? And um, I, I said I would, there is a slide which I skipped over yesterday and I just want to 
uh, take you through some uh, quick numbers on this. I think there are two things here. One is, you know, whether we should follow an export-led strategy of growth. And, and there, uh, you know, all the evidence seems to be that almost every country that grew very rapidly um, actually had ra very rapid export growth. So, so on the desirability question, I think the evidence speaks very strongly. The question now more and more is whether India will be able to do that because of this backlash against globalization and therefore you know, would we, will we be able to sell our exports uh, if uh, foreign markets shut down and so on. So in the latest survey we did some, you know, some quick and dirty numbers on how to think about this. So the question is can the world absorb another China as India? So here's how I, um, I, I, I think about this question. Uh, I'm going to be um, on my own here. Okay, so the way I think about this is that, think of, this is the world exports to services and goods export to GDP. Remember in the first chart I showed you that this there are great doubts about whether this can increase like it did in the past or not. So this is going to be fixed. Let's assume this is going to be fixed. And let's see, say, think of that as the political constraint on uh, uh, our being able to export. So we say that in terms of the change in the next 10 years, let's say this is fixed, i.e. the world cannot absorb more exports uh, uh, to GDP. Then this, the simple simulation we did here was, Supposing India has to grow at 8% uh, and China grows at 5% and therefore India's exports have to grow at 15%, what would it do to the world export to GDP ratio? Um, and it turns out that supposing Indian exports grew at uh, you know, this eight, uh, 15%, the world uh, export to GDP ratio would go, go by 0.8%. And China's, if China grows at this, so something will have to give if the world is able to absorb this extra exports. And the question is, uh, can it? Now, the reason why China makes a bigger impact than, than India, of course, is that the base here for China is much, much greater. So even though it grows slower going forward at 7% and India grows at 15%, we make a smaller dent on the world export to GDP ratio. In services, it's a little bit different. We now um, are, are a pretty big exporter of services. And if we, our exports grew at 15%, we will actually you know, increase the world services to GDP ratio by 0.5%. And the difference is that this extra, if we export this extra, you have to see it against what the world currently exports. Uh, so 0.8 and 21, we're still a small fraction of the world. But if we, you know, boom, if our exports boom, uh, it will account for a large share of existing world exports. So in that sense, um, if we see more protectionism uh, 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 in world markets, I think that could affect our services exports much more uh, than uh, our, our goods exports because we constitute such a small fraction of the world exports of, uh, uh, of goods. So this is just <clears throat> a kind of way of thinking about you know, can, how big are we? If we grow rapidly, how big will we become relative to the world? And, you know, will the world be able to absorb that? Will foreign markets be able to absorb that? So this is kind of a simple simulation. So what I take away from it is that if the world cannot, you know, carry, if there's going to be more protectionism, then uh, unless, you know, China reduces or other countries reduce their export share, um, we will maybe find it increasingly difficult to export, um, especially in services because we're already a big part of world services. So, so this is kind of a simple way of thinking about, you know, can the world absorb, i.e. if we did an export-led strategy, would we run into constraints uh, uh, overseas or not? Any questions? If not, we will, yeah, question please. Um, uh, just let's move to the, now to the next one. Indian corporate uh, has always been complaining about one thing.
which is a constraint for the exports also that infrastructure is one sector which which has not been developed by the government in almost all the countries this is one sector which is developed by the government and they say that this is one major hurdle for the development even for the manufacturing sector and now ppp as you also have the similar views that ppp is also not a good base so i mean what government or what do you think that how are we going to work on this problem if we really have to do well on exports so so the question is whether i mean uh, here remember i was focusing on foreign constraints to our growth uh, you've raised the question what are domestic domestic constraints to growth and we are now going to do power and railways okay let's let's move into um, also please uh, 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 please don't say that i said uh, ppp is a bad way to go i have made no, no <laughs> yeah i have made no no judgments yeah. about you know just uh, just the facts remember just the facts no opinions um, okay so today we are going to do um, um, you know infrastructure again remember that i feel that teaching infrastructure um, can be quite boring you know i mean you could have to say well we do power we do road we do railways we do telecom and say this went up this went down etc etc and so the the challenge is again here how do you make these uh, subjects come alive um and uh, so so uh, i don't know uh, how you all of you do it uh, because if i were to sit in a classroom and someone were to tell me that you know our capacity went up so much or this went down so much i would fall asleep um so so, so uh, the question is how do we make this come alive so we've chosen two sectors because we worked on them in principle you could also add road uh, telecom etc and i think telecom is an interesting example in another sense which i'll just come to so we're going to talk about so okay first uh, i think the way i would introduce uh, in infrastructure is to say these are public utilities you know electricity water railways etc these require large capital investments we know high fixed costs economies of scale long gestation periods and also increasingly we see now a, a new dimension to this in the last 20 years especially with telecoms and now with facebook uh, and 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 data there are network effects i uh, the value of something increases the more people that are part of these networks and that also gives rise to uh, you know uh, tendencies to monopolization so all these things uh, uh, tend to make public utilities uh, monopolies uh, now again that's not a hard and fast there are exceptions to this but broadly i think that is as a kind of characterization of public utilities so so the, the the dilemma is this right in the in the past we used to have all of these things being in the public sector and then we said well if you have them exclusively in the public sector we have inefficiencies so let's try you know if we can also bring in the private sector but then if you bring in the private sector you have other challenges as well you know there can be monopoly profits there can be high prices there can be poor service uh, there can be monopolistic behavior so how do we then uh, uh, you know deal with that so essentially we're dealing the essential dilemma for public utilities is that we want somehow to harness the efficiency of the private sector but without foregoing uh, you know without giving away or incurring some of the costs that could come with that uh, so so you know so this whole public sector private sector dilemma is always going to be there with with natural monopolies a uh, just a bit of history as i said even in india our industrial policy re uh, resolution said we will occupy the government the state will occupy the commanding heights and uh, the commanding heights certainly included being on top of telecom towers uh, but then you know uh, of course at that time there were no telecom towers but commanding heights certainly included all the utilities um but we know what happened with public uh, sector ownership um um and so what happened you know uh, certainly in the early 80s we had a combination of ideology you know these were the three people who really uh, uh, led the charge in privatizing uh, some of the public sector monopolies 
uh, you know, all of us know about the Reagan and Thatcher revolution, but many of the most, uh, you know, um, innovative experiments in this were actually done by Chile under uh, the general Pinochet. Um, and so it's a combination of the experience with public sector inefficiency combined with a change in ideology, but also combined with a change in technology. You know, t what we thought had to be done in the public sector certainly changed with technology. Best example is telecom. We thought that it all had to be done, fixed lines, public sector, and then we got wireless and so on. And that changed a lot about how we think about we should do this. So, so in some senses, uh, the, the way we, the world has moved into this is that we get less public ownership, but more and more public regulation of the private sector. So that's how, I mean, the world is trying to, to so, uh, you know, we have telecom, we have the telecom regulatory authority, power, we have the CERC, um, environment, we have an environmental regulator, uh, now railways, for example, we're going to get a rail regulator. The, the government has recently passed, uh, a, 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 I mean, it's going to has said, in fact, passed legislation saying there's going to be a rail regulator. So, so what we try and do is that we try and get more private sector into these public sector utilities, but we have to balance them with having better regulation because the, this is a sector that naturally tends towards uh, monopolization. Uh, I just wanted to read out, I think there's a joke that's attributed to uh, Indira Gandhi's communications minister, C.M. Stephen. He was the telecom minister. He declared in parliament in response to questions about, you know, those days telephones used to break down a lot. Uh, and he said um, telephones were a luxury, not a right. And that any Indian who is not satisfied with his telephone service could return his phone since there was an eight-year waiting list of people seeking this supposedly inadequate product. So, you know, our thinking now, you know, uh, you know there's so many ways in which this, that statement then seems uh, really quite silly now in retrospect about how, A, uh, you know, it is, uh, you know, it's not an, it's no longer, I mean, if you now tell people, even the poorest of the poor, that a phone is a luxury, I think you would be kind of, uh, I think, uh, rightfully, you know, laughed off. Um, so, so we're going to do power. Um, now, yeah? In the said No, no, that's just the, 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 the decision to occupy the commanding heights. Yeah. yeah. No, no, but but the, oh, the but that's over time, over time, yeah, yes, yes. yeah, yeah. That's all. I mean, yeah, that's that's just that's just. Uh, um. So so here uh, is is a is something that um, is now more and more used a lot in research, but also this shows you know this these are night lights from NASA, um, and at one level. This is amount, uh, this tells you a lot about, you know, the power sector, you know, how lights have increased. Uh, <clears throat> but more and more research is now using this as a proxy for, you know, uh, GDP growth, welfare advances. So night lights are a very hot topic in development research. They're used as proxies for all kinds of things. Let me just say for my t uh, t two pennies worth, in writing this survey, we also thought we would use uh, and these, these night lights data to see whether we could get better and more high frequency you know, information on state level performance. Is it the case that you know, the states within India, you know, given that the data come with a two, three year lag, given we don't know how, you know, how reliable these state level data are, we try to use this you know, to see whether you know, it kind of fitted state level data. And we were a little bit disappointed actually. So, so if you're going to use this night lights data to do research, uh, I would, one problem with, I mean, there are lots of issues with night lights data. The one thing that always strikes me about night light data, if you look there, is that, you know, places like, you know, Mumbai and Chennai, uh, which are close to the sea, somehow they don't show up as, you know, kind of big and bright as they should. You know, to me that, you know, it, it's a little bit puzzling, for example, why this, and, and this are not, you know, much, much brighter than this area. I mean, this is the, you know, what we did yesterday, the kind of the, you know, Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, Jharkhand, that kind of area. And I mean, the notion that Mumbai and, 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 and Chennai should be, 
you know, similar or less bright than that. You know, a little bit, uh, it makes me a little bit skeptical about this data. But this shows what has happened in night lights. I mean, under this government, a number of achievements have been made on the power sector. And I'm going to come to that, come to that in a second. But, uh, but these are, you know, very important achievements that have been made. And kind of this is a, uh, also, so on the one hand, there are achievements. On the other hand, we're also going to talk about some of the challenges. Are we going to show any clips here? No, we're not. I love that clip, uh, but we don't have that. Yeah, yeah. yeah let, let, let's sh show that clip if we can. But now you can't film this, otherwise YouTube, posting this on YouTube has be is becoming a problem. By the way, there's a problem with posting, uh, there's been with one or two of the modules, we, it, I mean on Twitter and all of you have pointed out, I think it relates to the fact that you can't have clips from... <laughs> So this is kind of, uh, uh, in some ways, what the power sector has been, uh, which I think the government is trying to reform. And uh, we have to now look at the, uh, <clears throat> so I want to take you to some interesting facts about uh, the power sector. India is the world's largest electricity producer. It's the fourth largest consumer. Um, per capita consumption is still very low. How about 1,000 kilowatt hours compared to you know, 13 times that in the US, despite having cheap tariffs. And of course, out of the 1.4 billion people with no access to power, India accounts for 30 million. This is, you know, uh, uh, sources are given here. But uh, as I said, in the last uh, you know, three years, we've had a very strong uh, uh, addition to capacity. And you see that access percentage of population with access to to power, India is behind uh, the BRICS countries. And uh, across the states, you see the same uh, access to power. You know, you see there on the states, uh, you know, the poorer states are indeed those states with uh, uh, less electricity. And, and someone yesterday was asking me, remember we did yesterday, I showed you uh, in, in one of those research things, we use a, a transmission and distribution losses as a proxy uh, for institutional capacity. 
Uh, well, it turns out to be a proxy for institutional capacity in a kind of metaphorical sense, but it's also literally correlated with how much power there is available to the people in, in those states. Um, but you know, but Delhi, Goa, Chhattisgarh, uh, Chandigarh <coughs> have, have attained uh, pr pretty good access levels. Uh, transmission and distribution losses, as you can see, uh, I India there is up there, is, is pretty high uh, uh, compared to BRICS peers. It's improved um, uh, over time, but it's still, you know, about 15, uh, maybe a little bit more. But this is transmission and distribution losses. But we measure this, you know, also in a slightly different way. It's called a ATC losses, aggregate technical and commercial losses. They include technical losses, theft, and also commercial losses due to non-payment of electricity bills. And what we see here is that, you know, again, you go towards the right, you see uh, states with pretty high, uh, and you, you see Jammu and Kashmir is amongst the uh, less well-performing states. And again, you see the same UP, West Bengal, Orissa, Bihar, Jharkhand, MP, Rajasthan, bringing up uh, the, 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 you know, the less uh, progressive part of this. So ATC, uh, AT&C losses are very high in India, and this is a big part of the problem. Um, now, just again, some interesting facts. I, I, I didn't, so, so just to give you an example, today, thermal represents 67% of capacity, hydro 14, and renewable 17. But we know that given the Prime Minister's commitment, in about 20 years, uh, this one is going to represent a, a much bigger fraction of uh, India's capacity. Uh, could be even, I don't know, 30% uh, percent or so. Um, in terms of generation, a surprising thing is that the private sector now is about 44%. If you had done this number calculation, say even 10 or you know, 15 years ago, this would have been virtually, I mean, almost nothing at all. It's increased a, a lot because you know, we brought in the private sector via PPP projects to generate uh, power uh, after 2003 when we passed the Electricity Act. So uh, the power sector is fascinating. Uh, I find the power sector very fascinating. Um, uh, by the way, uh, Navneeraj is my guru on the power sector. Any questions you should ask him. But the power sector is fascinating because it raises a number of uh, you know, issues about, you know, conceptual issues about how we should do this in principle and of course how we should, uh, what the challenges are. So broadly, as you know, in power, there are electricity, there are three stages to the process. There's generation, there's transmission, and there's distribution. So three, three stages, each with its own kind of rich set of issues that it raises. Now, so this is just to give you a sense of you know, the, whole, the whole historical evolution in this. So we have, you know, before 2003, basically we had monopoly uh, in a government monopoly in generation, that's G, government monopoly in transmission, and government monopoly in distribution. That's how we began before. After the Electricity Act of 2003, and after we brought in uh, the private sector via PPP projects, we noticed that, you know, this has changed. One, competition has been brought in. You know, we have a, a power generation now, both by the public and the private sectors. Uh, but in some sense, the only choice available here is to the distribution and retail company because they have a choice of who to buy it from. So this is basically where we are here, and we are in transition to this third phase where we are going to get also um, competition in this sector where we're going to, um, we should have had many here, uh, right? So we should, uh, so we're going to get potentially competition in distribution as well, so that then both, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you'll have a choice in terms of who you buy it from and, and also who sells it to you, so there'll be more choice. Consumers will then have choice. At the moment, the choice is only with the, uh, you know, distribution companies. So essentially we've moved from here to here and we're in transition here where we've brought in the private sector and competition in terms of generation and the next stage is to bring in and we call this open access because basically you have a choice of who you can buy it from. Now, a couple of things that it certainly I wasn't aware of, well, unless we, uh, until we did this thing, is that the interesting thing is that we do now have a sort of a market for, you know, 
a high frequency market for power. So in the sense that even today, um, company uh, uh, buyers who have who need more than one kilowatt hour, in principle, they can go to what's called a power exchange, where power is sold and bought on a daily basis. This today it accounts for about four percent of total power. You know, in in an ideal situation, more and more people would want to buy uh, power from this exchange rather than being. And I'm going to show you uh, rather than getting power through uh, alternative means. So, so uh, this is broadly, and of course, um, as we moved from you know this monopoly at every stage, we have also set up regulators for uh, uh, for the power sector. We have, in the case of power, because power is a is is a state subject, we have both a central regulator and a regulator in each of the states. You know, the regulators do many things, including fixed tariffs, the final tariffs for consumers. So, so we're seeing a kind of broadly consistent with what's happened internationally. We are so slowly moving and bringing in the private sector into this sector, which was initially, uh, at, least, at least until 15 years ago, entirely dominated by the public sector. Yeah. Well, so the question is, remember, I think essentially we still think that the transmission thing, there's still a huge number of fixed costs, and but even there we're getting elements of competition there. Uh, but I think that world over distribution uh, is, you know, uh, yeah, it's it can be competitive in places. Uh, Navu, you want to add something? Uh, in, in the mic, into the mic, into the mic. The thing is that uh, the wire businesses are supposed to be natural monopolies, but the retailing part can be done by uh, like different companies. So there as well, the idea is that uh, retailing will be done by uh, different companies, but the wire business still will be owned by a natural yeah, monopoly. Yeah, yeah that's right, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so, so, so this is where we are in terms of the structure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have one question. Qu question, not uh, yeah, comment. Uh, this pricing of the for the retailers is a problem in the private sector because it is regulated, so the generation is dependent upon the pricing. We could, yeah, 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 yeah. We'll, we'll, come, we'll come to prices in a second. Yeah. Um, so, 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 okay. So, which leads us to the next thing is, okay, uh, this is the, the the institutional structure you see in generation. We have state generating companies. We have NTPC, which is the national generating companies. We have independent, uh, 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 that's the private sector, but we also have captive plants. That's the, you know, there are companies which do their own generation. You need to get permission for that, but that's another. Uh, and then transmission we've shown, and distribution, of course, we have the state discounts, but increasingly, certainly in some cities, we know that in Delhi and Mumbai, we also have private uh, companies which are distributing power. And, uh, and I spoke about the power trading companies and power exchanges that in principle, uh, you know, some, some buyers and some sellers can interact on a high frequency basis. Uh, currently, I'm told that in this, you know, kind of high frequency market for power, that accounts for about 4% of the total power that is bought uh, and, and sold in the country. And then you have, of course, the final uh, consumers. Now, the, the interesting thing here is also, what is the contract structure in power? Essentially, we have, I think, you know, broadly two kinds of contracts. One is the, is the long-term contracts, and 90% of power is based on that. So specific sellers and specific buyers enter what are called PPAs, power purchase agreements, for 12 to 25 years, and is based on all kinds of, you know, uh, you know, I don't know how they price over 25 years, but they do. It's, it's a pretty uh, kind of hairy, complicated business. And then, of course, you have uh, you know, more short-term pricing, uh, uh, but that accounts for about five, the short-term contracts are 5%. And of course, this power exchanges, which is the kind of almost daily selling and buying of power, is about 4%. So long-term contracts are still a very big component of you know, the power market in India. And it's, it's creating, it's beginning to create a lot of complications, uh, one of which I will uh, explain in, in just a moment. Now, what are the challenges uh, in this sector? Um, and I think it's a fascinating sector. 
uh, we, we explored some of these challenges in the economic survey of last year. But uh, I'm going to go through, say, four or five or six ma major challenges that this uh, sector faces. So can anyone, uh, uh, can anyone guess what this is? Yeah. So a tariff schedule of, uh, 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 not an electricity board, this is a tariff schedule set by a regulator, one of the state regulators. So there's a story here which I have to tell you. So uh, a year and a half ago, now my, my staff are getting very uh, anxious that I'm going to commit a faux pas. So I'm not going to commit a faux pas because I'm no, not going to reveal identities. So a, a year and a half ago, I, I went to see a, a, a chief minister. I had spent about two hours with him. And I begin, began my conversation by saying, uh, Mr. Chief Minister, uh, do you know how many electricity tariffs there are in your state? Uh, and it turns out that two of his uh, you know, IAS people were sitting there. Uh, and um, so he turned to them and said, Kitne hai hamari state mein? So I've revealed already, that, you know, now you, can, you know that uh, it's not one of the southern states that I went to see. <laughs> <laughs> so, but th 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 that was intentional. Uh, now, uh, there are still enough. There are still enough Hindi-speaking states for there to be an, 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 an anonymity here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe if I get into accents, then you can kind of come in, to, <laughs> come in closer. So, so anyway, so so uh, he turned to them and said, "Kitne uh, So I think they kind of, you know, uh, uh, kind of little bit, you know, made things up as they went along, and then um, I, I said. Uh, Mantriji, I can guarantee you there are about 80 to 100 tariffs in your state. Uh, so he rang his uh, electric power secretary, and the power secretary kind of the conversation a bit awkward, and the con and basically the power secretary said, "No, no, sir, we have maybe 10 or 12." Huh? Uh, I said, uh, uh, "Minister, not possible. Hoi ni sakta. At least 70, 80 to 100." And then, then we started talking about other things. And, and then the, the power secretary rang back and said, nee, nee, ha, actually, bees ya pachis hai, ha. So I said, Minister, no, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't buy this. Must be at least. So the next morning, uh, I came back. Because when we had done this work, we had not actually seen the Bihar uh, tariff uh, schedule. We'd seen the other. <laughs> oh, oh, shit. <laughs> oh, my God. Please, 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 no, the, please, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. That, 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 that was, okay, so, so, I give, so I came back the next morning and asked Navu to, you know, to look into it. It turned out that, in fact, uh, I had a little bit exaggerated, say, instead of 80 or 90, they were actually 60 or 70. And so I rang him. Uh, he, he, he responded to my phone. I said, I've just checked it. Your power secretary is wrong. It's not 20 or 30. It's about 60 or 70 or whatever. So, uh, so in a sense, kind of, uh, we were right broadly. And the, the power secretary of the state was himself didn't know <laughs> how many, how many uh, tariffs his job to know. Now, why do I say all this? It's, it's a, it's a, I mean, I find it astonishing. I mean, think about this. This is something that you should convey to your students. Uh, it's astonishing that, you know, if you were to go and buy petroleum or toothpaste or some other essential, I mean, you take it for granted that if it's one market, it's one price. Why is it that in this case we have, you know, 70, 80, 90? And I'll show you some of the absurdities in this. There is, for example, I mean, in this, yeah, there is for a mushroom and rabbit farm, there is a separate tariff. Wetland farmers greater than 2.5 is something. Wet, uh, wetland farmers less than 2.5. Can you imagine the nightmare complexity of implementing this? You know, uh, for, uh, seasonal industries off season. Uh, Pissy culture, prawn culture is one. Sugarcane crushing is another. You know, so, so this is mind-bogglingly complex. Um, and we know that you know, the reason this is there 
it cannot be a good reason because you cannot distinguish all these things. You should not distinguish all these things. And yet we have this mind boggling complexity. So what is it about power? See, um, uh, for me, something like this, you know, when I see this, it makes me uh, really both uh, astonished, but also very angry. But when I find that all of you are not angry enough, that makes me even more angry. <laughs> So, so, so this is, I mean, it's astonishing. In no, I mean, no market do we think that there should be 800 or 100 prices for the same product. And yet we, and this is true for almost, I mean, again, uh, maybe I should go to another state and commit the same faux pas. But then, you know, but we know that we know that this is, uh, happens almost in every state. We have such mind boggling comp complexity. And for sure, this gives rise to a lot of corruption. There's no question about it. Uh, so, so and, and now the thing is that there's nothing that prevents, uh, 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 now this is by the way de determined by the state regulator, but there's nothing that you know, prevents uh, the state regulator from saying, you know, simple, let's just make 65. You know, you, okay, you want to have some differentiation, but you don't have to have this complexity. In fact, very recently, the power minister has taken up this issue and uh, there is going to be some uh, coordinated effort at uh, you know, reducing the complexity. You know, so so I think this is. I mean, for me, when I when I first saw this, when uh, my team did this research, uh, it was both a a, a, a very uh, interesting, but also something that I think we can work on by way of policy. So this is the first challenge. Yeah. So this is Andhra. Yeah. This is Andhra. Uh, this is Andhra. Tell. Uh, we're not even supposed to show this is Andhra actually. <laughs> huh? Uh, but it has kuppam anakapalli, so you know you don't have you can't hide it. But anyway, so this is I mean I think this is huh? it's a case exactly it's a case study. Uh, you know that we've at least looked at two states now. We looked at this and the other one, which I can't mention. But anyway, so this is one you know simple but actually very important reform that can happen uh, quite easily. So the second thing, of course, is we all know uh, and what has given rise to uh, oh, oh, I mean. Uh, to one of the new schemes that the government implemented two years ago, we know that the classic case is that you know distribution companies face huge losses, and again you see that the states which have the highest losses are you know familiar, UP, Rajasthan, Tamil Nadu, Madhya Pradesh, uh, so on. Why why we have these losses relates to the question that the that the gentleman asked, <clears throat> but certainly we can look at uh, this is one of the big challenges, and. The way it works, of course, it's like almost everything in India, whether it's railway tariff, power tariff, or the GST, or we try and use pricing as a tool for changing income distribution. Uh, my Marxist friends are not here today, I hope they're here, but basically, you know, almost every price we try and use to achieve, um, uh, uh, you know, to, so, so for example, what we do is that, on the right hand side you see agriculture and, and domestic, we try and keep the tariff low, but you know, once you do that, you have to uh, charge higher tariffs on other sectors, and, and this is what's called cross subsidization, and this cross subsidization, uh, of course, we, don't, we can't do it fully, uh, because that, that would make uh, industrial tariffs, railway tariffs, commercial tariffs too high, uh, and so we end up both you know, cross subsidizing and making losses because you know if you cross subsidize fully, I mean your industry would become completely uncompetitive. So, challenge one: complexity. Challenge two: losses. Uh, losses in turn arise because uh, you know the the key thing is that the, we try and meet our social equity objectives, our inequality objectives, by charging low prices for domestic and for agriculture. And often, of course, in many states. This is an average across across India. So uh, in, in many states, for example, this would be zero, uh, like for example in Punjab, correct? Um, so, so that's, and then, so, so this is a, a consequence of that. This plot uh, is, shows you cross country comparison. On, on the x axis, you see uh, tariffs, uh, tariffs, industrial tariffs, um, uh, on, on, and this is in terms of megawatt hour, not kilowatt hour. You see that if you measure tariffs in PPP terms, India is the most expensive here, 
you know, so you measure, you know, this is how expensive here, and this goes expensive here. If you measure it in terms of PPB dollars, India is very expensive. Even if you measure it at market exchange rates, India is kind of in the middle here. But the thing is that the, the dots, the color of the dots is meant to tell you whether, see, what matters is not just the price, but whether it's interrupted or uninterrupted power. So the red basically tells you the quality of electricity supply. That therefore, if you adjust the tariff by the quality of power supply, you will find that India is, uh, has very high tariffs adjusted for, for quality and for, and for continu continuity, and which of course contributes significantly to making um, Indian, uh, uh, Indian industry, especially those that are electricity intensive. Textiles, for example, uh, steel, for example, these are all very power intensive sectors and they become highly uncompetitive because of this policy. So um, if you use, one lesson is that if you use prices, you know, for multiple objectives, you know, you generally end up not meeting any of those objectives. Uh, because we know what happens uh, even in terms of, we saw even in terms of trying to give free power uh, to, to the, to the uh, agricultural sector, we know that there is kind of, uh, uh, from the data that we have, given that consumption is mostly by the, by the big farmers, you know, even in terms of attaining that equity objective, we don't end up fulfilling that. Now, <clears throat> this is the comparable thing across the states. You find that the red ones, you know, as you go up are the, uh, are the, uh, you know, the ones that are getting uh, high tariffs for industry. And you see that uh, Tamil Nadu is also a state which has actually, even though it's an advanced state, it, it has high and poor quality of power supply. Uh, uh, even, even Kerala, for example, or no, Karnataka, Kerala, they all seem to be, um, you know, so, so this is a cross-state cross chart of this. Now, if, if, if that complexity chart makes my blood boil, uh, I think this chart actually makes my blood boil as much. I was aghast, I was shocked when we did this research that in India today, remember yesterday, Dil hai Hindustani, are we one market for taxes? We're trying to become one. Uh, are we one market for uh, agricultural commodities? We saw that we're not. But it turns out that we're also not one market for electricity. If a company in one state wants to buy power from another state, it has to pay what are called cross-subsidy charges. That is, over and above the normal tariff, you have to have. So uh, I don't know, sir, I don't know whether, you, I know you don't believe in free trade uh, internationally, but I wonder whether you believe in free trade within India or not. But certainly in the case of power, we don't have free trade within India, which I think is, makes a mockery of India as one economic market. And really, these, some of these charges are quite high. So for example, Tamil Nadu, for example, uh, I don't know, you know, um, maybe when you're sitting in the Abba canteen, there will be no power. Maybe you get the food, but, but no power. Uh, because uh, uh, what happens is that these numbers, you know, if you look at something like three and a half cross subsidy, this is over and above whatever the five or six paise you may have to pay. This is on top of that. Yeah. yeah. So, so now you want to say something? Uh, 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 please, uh, yeah, the, the mic, please. So the current market rates are around two and a half rupees. Yeah. yeah. So you have to pay like three and a half rupees. This is like 100% tax. 100, more, more than 100. Yeah, more than 100% yeah. tax. So, so think of it this way. That, that, so supposing, supposing, supposing we said that to, to get, say, soap or shampoo, uh, um, you know, I don't know who the, I don't want to get into which, the, which states you have, you know, you bathe most often. I don't want to get into those sociological things. But if, for example, someone living in Kerala wanted to buy soap from, uh, you know, Tamil Nadu, if you said no, you'd have to pay 150% extra tax if it comes from thing. How would we th think about that in India? I mean, if you live in Haryana and you get something from Delhi, you have to pay 150% extra tax over and above. How would you feel? But that's exactly what we do in power. So, so this is something that came as a real surprise to me. Understand, what's the genesis of this? 
so, so, so the genesis, so the question is, what is the genesis for this? And see, the, the reason is, is the, the origin, I mean, the reason is very clear that because if you then allowed a, 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 a state, a company in a state to bribe from another state, then you could not sustain your own cross subsidization. And that's what leads to, you know, if you want to keep the cross subsidization domestically, because then, of course, you'll have nobody will buy from domestically, and then, you, you know, you will get into a, a, a spiral where your distribution companies become totally bankrupt, and, and, and so. So this is actually a response to a consequence of wanting to maintain crop subsidization within the state. Yeah, question for you. So it's not uh, against uh, interstate, uh, it is even within state, uh, the same thing is there. As you have mentioned that it is for, to subsidize the, uh, to maintain the cross subsidy rather than to discriminate against state or other, that kind of thing. Even from within state, if you purchase, you need to pay this. No. So two things there. One thing is that in power exchanges, because all of it is collective transaction, because you don't know like which state is, like which, from which, which, yeah, which generator is supplying in electricity to which supplier like buyer. because it comes into a grid a yeah, it's, yeah. Com it's a combined grid and you don't know whether it's a local supply or it's a supply from outside so like that differentiation doesn't exist so so therefore it is only for cross state it is but the thing is that most of the power is coming from uh, different states like chhattisgarh is the, we know that chhattisgarh uh, then uh, Chhattisgarh is one of the bigger suppliers. Gujarat is one of the bigger suppliers. Yeah. Amounts are different. Yeah. There is a cross subsidy yeah. inside the state also, but yeah. amounts are different. Yeah. Yeah. And second thing, sir, uh, this uh, uh, slide which you had shown, uh, slide number twelve about the low electricity excess. If you will see all those states which are having hundred percent level, there the amount is maximum. The uh, the the cross subsidy. Like uh, here, Tamil Nadu, AP, West Pongal, and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they are having low electricity, uh, their electricity excess is 100%. So that is the reason, and uh, the states which are having low electricity excess are having a very low, like Rajasthan, Himachal, Jharkhand, yeah, yeah. Pradesh. Yeah, no, see, no, th the point is that th this impedes one market in power. Uh, th that's the key point here, and, and therefore, you know, this is not something states impose exorbitant taxes on purchase from other states. We do not have one market in power. Uh, you know, of course, different states do it to different extents. But, but, yeah. Question. <clears throat> For instance, if you have thermal power in a uh, in one particular state, negative externality may, may be very high. So if somebody is producing and just consuming it, then it's easy for me because there is less environmental pollution in my state. So is no, it? No, but see, but, but then you see the, the, the problem with that argument is, if I uh, correctly, is that, but then that should, that externality arises regardless of who is buying that power. The, you buy it from your own state, you buy it from another state, there's still an externality. Right? Uh, uh, correct, Namu? Exactly. So, so, so that can't be a reason for this. Uh, I, I, so I love the fact that people, all of you are trying to come up with reasons to justify this. It's, it's, <laughs> so it's, it's very interesting. No, no, maybe there are, so, so maybe in the classroom you should try and, but that's not a good reason because if you generate, if you get the externality from production, right? Then, regardless of who's consuming that, you should uh, you should uh, charge for that externality. Yeah. Okay. So let's let's uh, yeah. Twenty. We'll come. Have we come to twenty-two yet? We've okay. Uh, what is the doubt, sir? Sir, this uh, uh, distribution company losses are there. Hmm. So right side means to Gujarat, Delhi, and Maharashtra. They have got negative. What is that rate mean? They making they're making s small profits. Yeah. Also got this APC losses, and you know uh, they, they are actually now they are trying to reduce it to 11 percent. Presently, 16 to 17 percent of losses they are bearing in the distribution. 
this is 14, 15 data. Yeah. So, so uh, uh, now would you want to answer that? So, so anyway, so, so the, uh, if the data, I mean, please go for yourself and check the data, but I think that, uh, you know, but, but by the way, it's not easy to compile data on these losses. Uh, for those of you, um, I mean, uh, I can say that my team spent about three months at least of two or three people because there was planning company data, there was power f PFC, Power Finance Corporation data. Then there's the actual DISCOM company data. The regulator has data. So try and putting it all together to a consistent, it's a very, it will be a very interesting research exercise, but it's actually not easy to do this. Um, now, I think one, one of the really, really, you know, new challenges that's arising, that's arisen uh, in India, and probably all over the world, actually it's not just in India, but it's all over the world. What is happening because of technological change, but also because of government policy of subsidization, the price of renewables, 2011, 18 rupees per kilowatt hour. Today, it's just over two. There are even some bids that are, are there some bids below? Huh? 2.4, 2.4, and declining, and declining. So on the one hand, and these are the rates for wind. So on the one hand, this is terrific news for the consumer because, you know, and for the environment. It's great news for the consumer and the environment. But as you know that in, uh, you know, in the real world, there are no uh, free lunches. There are some big challenges associated with that. I can think of at least one or two. One is, of course, I mean, I, I should maybe uh, go to this and come back. You see, what has happened is that many of these PPAs, many of the power generation that happened, um, two kinds of challenges. One, th there is at least now about 20 to 25,000 megawatts of uh, power that's been, uh, power capacity that's been created, where the cost of that generation are well above now what current prices are. So those basically have become uh, unviable. So, so it's just lying idle and we don't know how what's going to happen. I think the power minister is trying to, has just set up a committee or, or, or to try and see what's going to happen. So a lot of capacity was, remember, and all this capacity was created, uh, uh, some of it when oil prices were at 100 and whatever, uh, $20 a barrel. Uh, and you saw, you know, even renewable, we thought was not very high, uh, was very high, renewable costs were very high, and now we find that the world has changed. The second, the second, uh, so this is for new capacity created with no contracts. But then you also have, what about capacity created where you've entered into these 25 year contracts, but then the buyer is now saying, uh, you know, uh, you know, why should I be locked into buying power at five and six rupees a kilowatt hour when today I can get it at two and a half, three rupees a kilowatt hour? And to some extent, I think uh, that uh, that challenge we see uh, in, in recent, you know, uh, litigation, you know, two big power uh, generating companies had entered into long term contracts with the DISCOM uh, uh, for no fault of theirs. Their coal supply from Indonesia uh, uh, got interrupted. So the cost, the input cost went up. They went to the regulator at Aptel and said, please, uh, you know, allow us to pass on these costs to the DISCOM because our input costs went up and we had nothing to do with it. Uh, the, the, the regulator said, fine, you can do it. But the Supreme Court finally, very recently, about a month or two months ago said, no, if you had a contract, you have to do it at, on the original terms of the contract. So this is, I think, uh, I, again, I don't know how this is going to be resolved, but this is, you know, uh, quite, from an analytical point of view, it's very interesting, but from an actual practical point of view also, it's really very challenging. Suddenly, you, you, one source, the cost of one source of power declines. You had all this capacity created at a time when the prices were very different. What should you do? You know, of course, 
I think in an ideal world, if we had you know, good institutions, we would, we would uh, uh, be able to maybe renegotiate some of these contracts. But uh, what is happening outside? Just the AC. So, can, so, so, so this is one uh, big challenge that's arisen with, uh, with power today. And uh, you know, going forward, we're going to have to deal with it. Yep. 26, you want to go to slide 26? I think, but we cannot write solar because they're okay. okay. So what do you think? Wind energy. Wind, wind. So you see, you see, wind prices are there. Also, all the data you want is here, my friends. Uh, so now, when you go back, so I, the way I think about all of you is that you'll go back and do a course on the Indian economy. Everything is ready made for you. Everything is ready made. It's all here. And then, and then when you show it, I hope some student stands up and says, "Sir." This is not solar, this is solar the photovoltaic. Please make the change. So I think that's what, uh, and you, you, all of you should do that, actually, yeah. Ah, uh, yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. The most important change you have to make is, um, and then I will sue for, for violation of intellectual property rights. Sue you for intellectual, and of course the Supreme Court will vote in your favor. <laughs> Okay, so, so, so then, so this is, I think, I, I, I cannot tell you what a, what a very significant development this is, which has both its huge benefits, but also raises a whole set of complications. One number is that the, you know, the amount of capacity that we've created, thermal capacity, uh, could involve loans of about one lakh crores, and so, you know, how do we do, is this going to add to the NPA problem that we spoke about earlier is a big policy challenge as well. So I think that, you know, at least for a few years, I think you can teach, I think, the power sector to your students, which I think would make it really uh, come alive because lots of interesting, very, very topical and interesting things. Actually, you should also teach the telecom sector because very interesting things are happening there. S somebody doesn't like us today. Yeah, exactly, okay. So let, let me, uh, 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 one last, uh, okay. This is the last uh, uh, challenge. You know, people, this is, I think, in some ways, the irony in India today that we have both excess demand, because remember, access to power is still not as much as it should be, although we've made great strides in, in, in doing 24-7 power. You still have a lot of states thing, but we also have excess capacity, excess supply. Plant load factors have declined very sharply. And so on the right, you see uh, you know, declining plant load factors, which shows excess supply. On the left-hand side, you show you know, still so many people need power. Uh, so that's excess demand. And this is where, I think this is how, one of the paradoxes about India today is that we have both excess demand and excess supply at the same time. So that's for the thermal sector? Yeah, that's, uh, uh, that's thermal, exactly, thermal, yeah. Uh, this is this is this is this is how this is how it happens because you know basically what we have is that um, and this is a kind of market failure right because failure. yeah so 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 you have yeah exactly you have you know and because of all these complexities and so on we have a situation where um, you know basically discoms uh, are are running or many discoms are running huge losses and so they cannot buy power. Generally, in infrastructure, we have uh, PPP kind of projects. So, uh, and these projects would be long term. Now, when you are mentioning about the risk that are involved in long terms, do you think the uh, terms of uh, agreements can change because there would be external shocks and external sure, so that, But that's exactly what I was saying. That you know, we need given that these are, you know, whenever you have huge fixed costs, right? You have to have long term contracts. But if the market is very dynamic 
and lots of change happens, you know, those contracts become, you know, superseded. So essentially what we need is how do we optimally renegotiate these contracts? And I think it's, it's going to be very difficult. Well, let me finish and then we can do the question. So this is my last slide. I think in response to, you know, the problem of the discom uh, uh, losses, uh, two, three, uh, two years ago, a year and a half ago, the government started a new scheme called Uday. And basically what happened in Uday is that the states took over the discom debt uh, and, you know, pro progressively, they issued, uh, uh, issued bonds instead. And so the discoms now have less uh, uh, debt. Uh, they've been taken over by the states. Uh, it's kind of relief for them. But, you know, what they've done is this relief is conditional on certain reforms that the discoms have to enact. You know, they have to reduce at and losses. They have to do more metering because essentially that, uh, you know, we need, uh, we can't have the same thing again and again where basically that you, uh, you know, we take over the debt but you do nothing, no reforms. So that, because remember, we had a similar situation with the discoms uh, in, the, in the early 2000s as well. So this is a problem that keeps recurring. And in a sense, <coughs> all of this, you know, there is a, a, a deep, deep political origin to all of this, which is actually very simple, but you know, a, a kind of uh, the, the first order fact, which is that if we want to provide, you know, power, free power, cheap power to, uh, a, 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 you know, a, a whole set of consumers, I mean, this is going to be intrinsic to that. So how do we figure out a way of, you know, this very deep political economy problem of, you know, being able to uh, charge for power so that, you know, in a, so that then you don't have to have losses, you may not have to have, or at least not to the same extent, and don't have to cross subsidize uh, as well. I mean, the point, I mean, the high, high tariff, high industrial tariffs, um, I think if you, if you do surveys of firms, especially the smaller firms, oh, I, I, I didn't tell you, of course, one more thing, fact is that, so, Many, many uh, uh, firms, you know, of course, depending on size, they do different things because they either get power at very expensive rates or the, the quality of power is not very good. They have their own generators. It could often be diesel uh, uh, powered generators. There, then what happens is that, of course, costs go up and environmental costs also go up as a result of that because burning diesel is much more so. Uh, it leads to a lot of pathologies. I think that it's something that, you know, uh, all governments have struggled with. But those are some of the root causes of the problem. Uh, and what you see here are some of the, you know, kind of the manifestations of these deeper problems. So 11.15, um, we should take a quick break. And then I think the, the next one is going to be on railways, which will be a little bit shorter. But um, do you want to take questions now or when you come back? Question. Huh? Okay. Have your tea uh, and coffee. Let's sh sharp 11:30. We take five to ten minutes of questions. We'll spend about half an hour, 40 minutes on railways, and then we can all have lunch together. Thank you.